We are uh, in the midst of a four-part study. Uh, if you've joined us the last couple of weeks, you already know that we've been discussing the topic of stumbling blocks. And um, the first two parts, we dealt with the different ways that the enemy, also called Satan, is a stumbling block. In, and this week we are uh, intent on discussing the third, I should say the second stumbling block that uh, most of us, all of us actually, uh, could potentially face and will potentially face and have faced and will face until, uh, I guess, only for the last person in the world will we not face this kind of stumbling block. And that stumbling block is man. And uh, we're going to discuss some scriptures dealing with how man is a stumbling block. Man is often his own worst enemy. You know, here we're trying to do the things that please the Heavenly Father and we end up being our own worst enemy. Of course, not all of us are trying to please the Heavenly Father, but, um, you know, the, we, we have to know, we have to be aware, and we have to be prepared for this potential stumbling block in our life and how we deal with it and what we do about it and how we're going to um, prepare for it and what are the different ways that man is a stumbling block very important questions for us to talk about um, now when it comes to um, stumbling there are a couple things that we have to be concerned about. First of all, we need to be aware and alert that there's a possibility for another person to come into our lives and create a lot of stumbling for us, or even for other members of our family, especially our children. Uh, and then the second second thing we got to be concerned about is that we need to be very, very, very careful that we do not do anything that could potentially cause stumbling for somebody else. We don't want to stumble and we don't want to cause stumbling for another person. That's very important. And, um, and so first we're going to look at the different ways that men can cause other men, uh, include women and children and all this, of course, of how the different ways that people can be stumbling blocks for each other. Now, a stumbling block is something that is uh, set up in our way, and um, that you know we're trying to walk the straight, the the narrow path that leads to eternal life, and we're called to not look to the left and not look to the right. And um, if there's some darkness up ahead, and we're not focused. Uh, on letting the light of Yahweh illuminate our path, then there is a possibility that we could be caused to stumble. And it's a spiritual um, meaning here. And so, some examples in Scripture of where Scripture speaks about the possibility of men stumbling. Here we have Psalm 140, verse 4. It says, Keep me, O Yahweh, and from the hands of the wicked, Preserve me from violent men who have purposed to make my steps stumble. And so wicked and violent men are among the kinds of people that we need to look out for that could cause us to stumble. Now, the author of this psalm, David, obviously had his share of wicked and violent men trying to cause him to stumble and um, and Yahweh delivered him from all of his enemies hallelujah and um, so look out for the wicked and look out for those who are violent Psalm 1 Psalm 73 verses 1 through 3 says truly Elohim is good to Israel to such as are pure in heart but as for me my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the boastful. When I saw the prosperity 
of the wicked. Now we look around us today and you do see the wicked pros prospering at times. You do see uh, the wicked people of the earth actually uh, doing pretty well a lot of times financially. Um, and it causes you to wonder, well, you know, where is the blessing? You know, we are told in the, in the Torah that we will be blessed if we serve Yahweh. And, um, you know, you see uh, some people who are wicked who are not in trouble like other men and they're not plagued and uh, pride is their necklace and they just scoff and speak wickedly and um, speak loftily. They're very prideful. And uh, they even speak against Yahweh and the heavens. And uh, and they just question the existence of Elohim, questioning whether he would know or not. And um, But there's one thing we have to remember. That we have to look at things from a spiritual standpoint. And, uh, and the true riches, first of all, is what we're after. Not the temporary riches. And there's a scripture that does say, and I don't have it here in front of me, but it says, the wicked rise only that they may be cut off and destroyed. You know, if you're always constantly on, you know, facing adversity and destruction in your life, then you may not, um, you may not quite understand or, or be brought down to the point where you need to be brought down unless you're first brought to prosperity and a lot of times Yahweh will cause the wicked to prosper and then bring them down low and that is the best environment for them to potentially repent and receive salvation so you know we don't fret over what is happening in the lives of evil men we don't envy them and um, and we don't follow them but all the rich folks that are around you uh, if you're having you know if you have uh, financial issues or whatever uh, you look around you and you see all these people that are doing well and they don't and Elohim is not in their thoughts and uh, even this the, the author of the psalm here 73 the psalm of Asaph um, he questioned he nearly slipped and uh, so we got to look at spiritual. We can't look at the physical. And as Yahushua said, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of heaven. So it's a very, very um, serious source of stumbling for a lot of people. Prosperity. There's a big prosperity message out there today. You know that um, you know if you um, want prosperity then you know of course they say give to our church or give to our organization or our ministry and you'll be prosperous and um, there's lots of messages even on Christian radio now about how to make lots of money and um, you know in, in the days of Solomon and all his glory great you know hallelujah Yahweh is establishing his kingdom on the earth Blessed to be the name of Yahweh. But right now, we we have another kingdom we're looking to. And that's the kingdom Yahshua will set up at his return. And so whatever riches are going on right now in this world is not really our focus. And, um, and it needs to not be our focus. Very, very dangerous for us to focus on that. And uh, a lot of times it is the riches that becomes an idol. The things that we own, or that we think we own... Uh, become things that own us and um, the way they own us is by having you know control over us and power over us and our love for those things become idols in our hearts and that is the next stumbling block Ezekiel 14 verse 2 says the word of Yahweh came to me saying son of man these men have set up their idols in their hearts and put before them that which causes them to stumble into iniquity. Should I let myself be inquired of at all by them? That I may seize the house of Israel. I'm sorry, I skipped a verse there. Uh, it says, Therefore, thus speak to them, thus says the Master Yahweh, Every one of the house of Israel who sets up his idols in his heart and puts before him 
that which causes him to stumble into iniquity and comes to the prophet, I will answer him who comes according to the multitude of his idols. That I may seize the house of Israel by their heart, because they are all estranged from me by their idols. Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Master Yahweh, Repent, turn away from your idols, and turn your faces away from all your abominations. So, even in ancient days, there was an idolatry that was an idolatry that was in the heart. Yahweh has always been concerned about the heart. That's just that's not just a what they call a New Testament concept. That is something that has always been true. Even in Ezekiel's day here, we see that very clearly. And so, are there any idols in our hearts? Anything to which we give undue affection and devotion that is standing in between us and our worship of Yahweh without hindrance? Is there anything that becomes a stumbling block? And only each of us individually can really answer that question. Do we have any idols in our hearts? Do we have idols such as things that we own? Such as uh, things that we've grown affectionate toward? You know, sometimes even a spouse, a family, or children can become idols to us um, if we're placing them ahead of Yahweh. Ever thought about that? Or a friend, or a father, or a grandfather. Anything that causes us to stumble anything that would that would potentially keep us from really being able to keep the commandments of Yahweh as he's expecting can become an idol that we've set up in our hearts and that's very dangerous and um, and says Yahweh will answer us according to our idols and so that becomes a stumbling block now if our meditation and our heart and our love and our affections are drawn toward and excited by and and focused on the ways of Yahweh we have a promise in the scriptures Proverbs chapter 3 verse 19 it says Yahweh by wisdom founded the earth by understanding he established the heavens by his knowledge the depths were broken up and clouds dropped down the dew my son let them that's the wisdom the commands of Yahweh not depart from your eyes keep sound wisdom and discretion so they will be life to your soul and grace to your neck then you will walk safely in your way and your foot will not stumble so if we have the light of Yahweh's word in front of us then the stumbling blocks will be exposed and then we can do something about them but if we're not really focused and and led by the word of Yahweh in our life uh, and it sort of collects dust, you know, just sits there and collects dust and we don't really do anything with it. Then we're going to be blinded in many areas and we're not going to know where we're going. And so we have to be attentive to the wisdom of Yahweh so that we may have we might have a, a lamp before our feet and a light unto our path. And then we will not be caused to stumble. And that and, and that's the thing about the our walk you know as we read the word of Yahweh as we learn more about Yahweh's will for us as we gain more wisdom through our study of his word then our path the path we walk on becomes brighter and brighter and brighter and the scripture says this Proverbs 418 but the path of the just is like the shining Sun it shines ever brighter unto the perfect day the way of the wicked is like darkness they do not know what cut what makes them stumble they have not figured it out they don't understand why they're even stumbling in life because they're walking in darkness they don't 
see the stumbling blocks that's in their path. They don't have the light of Yahweh's word causing them to have a path that's illuminated and able to see. And so the words of Yahweh teach us how to love. They teach us how to love our fellow man. They teach us how to love Yahweh. And as we seek his precepts, we will not stumble. And as we walk in that love, we will not stumble. First John chapter 2 verse 10. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes and so if we want to not stumble we need to walk in love and that's the blessing of the word of Yahweh is that we are able to walk in love now we shared a little bit last week I believe it was last week about not having our the the planting of Yahweh's word in soil that is fit for growth and our heart is that soil and Yahshua gave a parable about the sower of the seed and how the the seeds some of them s fell among the wayside where the the birds ate them and eat the seeds and and others fell among stony places and and the uh, the plant would grow up and take root for a while and grow up but then would no longer be able to grow because it doesn't have enough soil there to produce to get the nutrients it needs to survive and then we have and the water and then we have the seed among thorns um, where the thorns just overgrow and choke out the the plant and then there's the seed that fell among the good soil now it's the seed that falls among the stony places that is actually the seed that um, where someone they hear the word of Yahweh they immediately receive it with joy yet it says he has no root in himself but endures only for a while for when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word immediately he stumbles and so how do we know whether we are among those who are receiving this word in with a, with a stony stony place? It's a stony uh, area of soil. How do we know if our soil is stony or not? Well, if, if it's not really taken deep root, there are lots of things that can prevent it from really taking a deep root. Um, that the word, we, we were excited about it. You know, we were hearers of the word. But then we were not really doers. We heard it. We got excited about it. Yeah, we want to do it. But our love for Yahweh was not strong enough to where when troubles come, when tribulations come, then we overcome. Instead, we stumble. And so I really think it's the root is really in our love for Yahweh. When we, we, we really love Yahweh, we really want to hear what he has to say. We're really... We're not just excited for a time and, and and then walk away from it and then forget what manner of man we were. We hear the word. We're excited about the word. It really takes strong root in us and then we do it. And um, it's tribulations and tests that really kind of reveal where that seed has really been planted. Is it on good soil or not? So anyway there are, now there are, there are two different things specifically that people will stumble over two different things and the first one is in Hosea chapter 14 verse 9 where it says who is wise let him understand these things who is prudent let him know them for the ways of Yahweh are right the righteous walk in them but transgressors stumble in them sorry about the background my wife is <laughs> running the mower <laughs> but um hold on just a minute
Thank you. <laughs> so who is wise? Let him understand these things. Who is prudent? Let him know them. For the ways of Yahweh are right. The righteous walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. Very interesting. And so the word of Yahweh can cause us to either walk in them, the ways of Yahweh, we either walk in them or we stumble in them. One of the two things. And so actually the scriptures, Yahweh's word, is something that becomes a stepping stone for those of us who are believers, but then a stumbling block for those who are not. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 27. An unjust man is an abomination to the righteous, and he who is upright in the way is an abomination to the wicked. Very interesting. And so what we're going to find, brothers, is this. That those who do not love the word of Yahweh, those who do not love Yahweh, when they see us walking in the pathway of Yahweh and in doing the things that he's called us to do, they're not going to like it. In fact, they're going to hate it. And a lot of times they will mock us for trying to keep the way of Yahweh. Now, if we did not have our seed sown in stony places... If we didn't really, if we had a good heart and not a stony heart, then when the word of Yahweh comes into us and the tribulation comes, it won't matter what people think about us or what they say about us. And so they may find us to be an abomination. They may mock us. They may think that the things that we do are just silly and stupid and wrong or whatever. But because our, our, um, our affections are not toward what men do or what men say or what men think. And our affections are toward what Yahweh says in his word. It's not going to matter. Because this goes with the territory. They don't like us. They don't. And that's just the way it is. And the same is true here. We see that the transgressors, they look at the word of Yahweh. It doesn't do anything for them. They stumble in that because the darkness hates the light. And that's the way things are. We have two entities at work, those who are children of Yahweh and those who are children of his enemy, Satan the devil. And those who are children of his enemy, of course, are going to persecute those who are children of Yahweh because of the spirit of the wrong spirit dwelling in them. So, now, even, even among those who may delight in the commandments, or at least say they do, there is a second possibility of stumbling. And that, pos that stumbling block, the potential stumbling block, believe it or not, is Yahshua the Messiah. Now, it may not be so much true in our nation, with a very uh, Christian-oriented nation, but, um, but it certainly was true in the first century in other nations as well. Romans chapter 9, verse 30 says, What shall we say then? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained to to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Sion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Isn't that interesting? So Yahshua the Messiah is actually, uh, uh, to the Jews, he is a stumbling, a stumbling block, a rock of offense. They seemed to have a love for the law, but in reality their love was for man's law, as we saw in the first century quite a bit. But um, 
the Messiah himself became a stone of stumbling. And it's the same true about us. People will look at our lives because we have Yahshua dwelling in us, and they will stumble over that rather than being enlightened by it. Um, now, this stumbling that is spoken of, uh, we see it clearly when they, when the Messiah came and they, they killed him, crucified him. They would not humble themselves. Some of them did. Many of them did not humble themselves and say, you know, that was wrong of us to do that. They couldn't fathom that they had done something wrong. But this stumbling to which they had stumbled is not a permanent stumbling because in Romans 11, verse 11, Paul makes the point here. He says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Very interesting. The reason for the Gentiles coming in, according to this scripture here, was so that Israel would be provoked to jealousy. Now, one of the points I make on the uh, Hebraic Roots video is, you know, there's today there's not much in Christianity that's going to provoke a Jew to jealousy. I mean, with the uh, hog roasts and the um, and the uh, Santa Claus and the Easter bunnies and the Sunday worship and the law being abolished and and all these things and and rejection of the feast days and so on. There's just not much in Christianity to provoke a, a the average Jewish person to jealousy. And so you don't see them coming to the Messiah typically through this Christian way of being the way the Messiah is being presented in Christianity. Uh, and yet Paul said here the whole purpose of Gentiles coming in was so that salvation would come to the Jewish people. And um, but that's not what happened, is it? We we know actually what did happen. The Gentiles came in, and uh, and just like the Jews, who they judged, uh, a lot of them were very judgmental and hateful toward the Jewish people for having killed Yahshua. And um, and the Gentiles came in, and they also got caught up in their commandments and doctrines of men. And just as the Jewish people hated the Gentiles, the Gentiles began to hate the Jewish people, which is very contradictory because Yahshua the Messiah himself was a Jewish man. But there was a lot of anti-Semitism and a lot of arrogance. And Paul warned the Gentiles about this, specifically the Gentiles in Rome. He said, Speaking of the Jews, he said in Romans 11.20, he said, Because of unbelief they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if Elohim did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore consider the goodness and severity of Elohim on those who fell, severity but toward you, goodness. If you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. And so, what was that goodness of the Messiah that they were supposed to continue in? It was that walking as Yahshua walked, that walking in the Torah, exactly. And so, they did not continue in that goodness, but they became haughty and arrogant, and they boasted against the branches. And to this day, we still see it. Now, it was very prevalent um, soon after the uh, Jewish uprising against Rome. There was a lot of, of um, anti-Semitic uh, fervor going on. And uh, anything to do with Jews, uh, people would be very heavily persecuted for. I mean, imagine, uh, let's say that all the... Um, the, Me the people of Mexican descent decided to try to take over the state of New Mexico and make that part of a new country. What do you think would happen uh, in our nation if, if the Mexicans all got together and did that? 
probably a lot of anti-Mexicanism, right? Um, the the kind of culture that they they live in, a lot of people would begin to despise. This says during World War II, um, the Japanese were mocked um, and hated because of what they did and coming against. And even people that lived in the United States who were fully American, yet they had Japanese descent, were often mocked and hated. And the same thing was going on right after the Jews tried to uprise against Rome in 70 AD. You know there would have been a lot of anti-Semitism and Jew hatred. Because a lot of them, the Roman army, came up and fought against uh, the Jews. And a lot of the people in the Roman army lost their lives. And, um, and so there was a lot of anti-Semitism going on. Well... Along comes, you know, Gentile believers trying to believe in the Messiah. Um, and what's going to happen? Well, there's going to be a lot of this, well, I don't want to look like Jews. And it just so happens that the Jewish-looking things, like tassels, like Sabbath, like feast days like eating kosher and eating clean meats and using Hebrew names instead of Greek names. Uh, all those things became intolerable to the Gentile mind because of the association with Jews. Other parts of Yahweh's law, no problem. You know, like love your neighbor as yourself, love your enemies, um, you know, to turn away from idolatry even. Um, and things like that, they could handle those things. But things that made them look Jewish, all that got stripped. And, um, and, and that's why today, even today, you'll have Christians, mainstream Christians, mainstream church teachers, who will say, uh, well, we need to do this part in the law which says uh, this, but this other part of the law, we don't do that. Uh, even though it, it would very much apply and they, the reason they say, oh, that's Jewish. You know, the law is Jewish. Just stuff for the Jews, we don't do that. And so this disassociation with things Jewish is the very thing that they were warned about. This haughtiness. And um, that's what he says here in, in verse 25. A little later he says, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. You know, Proverbs says, if you're wise in your own eyes, there is more hope for a fool than you. He said, this blindness in part has happened until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And we're looking at this time today. I think the fullness of the Gentiles are coming to an end. And and, and now, because there is more, uh, there are more believers in the Messiah who are starting to see the blessing of the Hebraic roots of Christianity and starting to keep things like the Sabbath and other things, uh, the gen the Jewish people are looking over and, you know, saying, uh, what, what, what are those Christians doing over there building a sukkah? You know, <laughs> and they get curious. What's this all about? And then they find out we're actually keeping the commands better than they do a lot of times. And, um, and so that's going to provoke them to jealousy. But there was, but, uh, but looking way back when this all started, and we can even see this through some of the writings of these uh, church fathers. And uh, one of the church fathers, uh, who the Catholic Church claims to be a fairly early church father, was a man named Ignatius. And uh, look at this quote that he says here in um, his, uh, his letter to the Magnesians. He says, if therefore those who were brought up in the ancient order of things have come to possession of a new hope, in other words, the Jews, uh, no longer observing the Sabbath, but living in observance of the Lord's day, on which also our life has sprung up again by him and by his death. So that he was basically teaching against observing the Sabbath and instead observing what he called the Lord's day or the Master's day. And uh, this is Ignatius, um, and the church actually claims, Catholic Church claims, this man was a disciple of John. And, of course, they can't prove that. 
They also claim he lived until around 108 AD. And I'm going to tell you something right now. When, when, a, when a person who is going to seminary reads a quote like this by a man who is said to be such an early believer and even a disciple of John, they claim he is. They, of course, they have no proof. But uh, this man and also Polycarp claim, claims or are said to be disciples of John. And a man like this teaches against the observance of the Sabbath. Um, it causes them to pretty much say, you know, how can someone that was that early a believer have abandoned the Sabbath? How is that, that even possible? Well, you know there's another man by, around that same time period named Marcion. And Marcion taught that only Paul's writings were legitimate. And everything else was not to be obeyed or heeded because that's for those Jewish people. In fact, Marcion taught that the Old Testament God or Mighty One was different, complete different God altogether. And um, and so this uh, this is the the things that was going on during this uh, this time period after 70 A.D. after the Jewish uprising against Rome and a lot of the believers in the Messiah Yahshua were persecuted and many of them were killed and the reason why is because they were associated with Jews I think is one major reason um, then who there's this void there's this void and um, and so the Gentile leaders step in and they don't want to look Jewish and so they start teaching against the observance of Sabbath and so on. So the modern seminary students, they just can't fathom that the that someone, a believer, quoting something so early could possibly be wrong. But believe it or not, there were teach, false teachers even during the time of, of Yahshua, um, I'm sorry, during the time of the apostles, uh, 60s, 50s, 60s, uh, A.D. and uh, and even Paul mentioned during this time period um, he was talking to the assembly, the congregation at Ephesus, and he said this. He said, "For I know this, Acts twenty verse twenty nine. For I know this that after my departure, this is after he gets imprisoned, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock." Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch. And remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone, day and night, with tears. So for three years, Paul is warning about an apostasy that's going to take place. And um, and so, if an apostasy was possible during this time period, certainly an apostasy was quite possible not long after as well. And he even predicted it would happen. And so, we cannot, brothers, we cannot put confidence in what church fathers teach. But I'm going to tell you right now, most people that go through cemetery are taught these church fathers' writings and they read about them and they're so impressed by their martyrdom, the way that they held fast to the Messiah, and all these stories. Um, a lot of them are just unbelievable. They're not even, they can't even be true. Um, you know, this Fox's Book of the Martyrs and, and how glorious these early church fathers were and and how they were eaten by lions and all these other things and how glorious they were and so they get this almost like a soul tie to these men and they read their writings and they become impressed by them they become very impressed by these church fathers and even today if you were to turn on the radio and listen to a man I'm gonna, I'll mention his name Hank Hanegraaff it's a Bible Answer Man show um, one of the things he always says is, 
there are certain things that are essentials that are, uh, as he puts it, um, you know, under the pale of orthodoxy, the historic Christian faith. And uh, what he's looking at, what his eyes he's really talking about is the church fathers. What did the church fathers teach? The church fathers uh, taught different things. Trinity, they taught abolishment of the law and different things. They taught all these things which he regards to be the, the, the standard bearer of orthodoxy. And uh, if it's according to what those essentials are in his mind, which is what the church fathers taught, that's really the foundation of Christianity today. And I've seen this over and over and over and over again. Uh, people who will not, I mean leaders, pastors, who will not turn to the Torah, who will not accept the Sabbath and these kind of things, um, you kind of do a little research, start dig digging around, start answering questions. The bottom line is they just like that Christianity. They, they like it. They like what the church, the church fathers, the whole historical thing. They cannot fathom that all those people over all of those years, all those writings, all the things that happened, that those people could be wrong. They just can't fathom it. It just does not compute. <laughs> and so, um, and so, their real foundation is in churchianity. That's their foundation, and and it happens with even people today who are not pastors and so on and um, the same is true in in you know in Judaism which I'll get to in a minute but you know men become and this is what I want to talk to you about is men become stumbling blocks men become the stumbling blocks because they're not looking to the scriptures really I mean they read it but they're going to interpret it through the lenses of of historical Christianity rather than what the first century believers were actually doing. And so um, I know that um, there's this persona that people like to follow, you know, and even within different denominations, there's a certain persona that they're locked into that they're really trying to follow. You know, there's the, um, the Baptist persona, uh, there's the Pentecostal persona and what they're about the Mennonite and Amish persona and and in most of the leaders in these various denominations at some point have been highly impressed with someone some man who's not in the Bible and um, they like their their the way they live their life and it's hard for them to fathom that those men could be wrong and that's how denominations actually got their start. You have Luther and the you know, he, he nails the thesis on the board and on the on the door, uh, and and people read it and they see, wait a minute, yeah, this guy's right. Because the scriptures uh are teaching one thing and the Catholic Church is teaching another. And so people start to gather around and follow Luther. Well then someone in that group at some point is gonna keep reading scripture and say, wait a minute something's amiss here we're not doing this and then there are other people in the group are going to say well luther never taught that and um and so they go off and they start their little group and then someone in that group rises up and says wait a minute this scripture over here and they well that's not what our leader taught and they go over somewhere else and then you got all these little branches of little things where what's keeping people from being able to grow is man. Men and his denominations is keeping people from being able to continue to walk in truth. And that's how man becomes a stumbling block in the church world today. Uh, and the same is true even in individual instances where Let's say you have a dad or a grandfather or an uncle or an aunt or a grandmother or somebody that you're just so highly impressed with you can't fathom the possibility that they could possibly be wrong about so many things. And so there is this thought, well, you know, if I live like my grandpa lived, then I'll be fine. Or if I live like 
whoever, you pick a person, lived, I'll be okay because they were a great man. Wrong, wrong, a thousand times. We cannot look to man. We've got to look to Yahshua the Messiah. How did he live his life? He is our shepherd. Nobody else is worthy of being our shepherd as far as following to the ends of the earth. Now, Judaism has the same problem. Judaism has the same problem. They're, they're so highly impressed with the first century rabbis and their teachings. And they've codified the teachings of the first century rabbis in something called the Talmud. And within the Talmud, there is the, the uh, Mishnah, which is the center portion of every tractate page. There's this section called the Mishnah. And these are the teachings of, you know, like Hillel and Shammai and these guys um, who were popular during Yahshua's day. And then there's the Gemara, which is the um, Babylonian, you know, in the Talmud, the rabbis living uh, a couple hundred years later all commented on this Mishnah. And then there's Rashi in his commentary on both. And so all this, all these tractates of the Talmud is just commentary on on what's going on in the first century commentary on the on the torah and and the reality is in israel today and in judaism today the real focal point is on this and they call this the oral torah and they believe the oral torah is just as binding and even more binding in many cases than what's written and in, in the actual pages of scripture and um and so it's the focal point once again, people are highly impressed by rabbis, and they're following man. They have their highly decorated, decorated rabbis that they look back to, just like Christianity, doing the exact same thing. Now, the Jews of first century Judaism, um, as a whole, m many of them did not accept the Messiah because of the teachings of these rabbis. And the Jews of the 21st century in many cases, are still doing the same thing. These very teachings, Yahshua said, beware of the leaven of the scribes and Pharisees, and the very teachings, their doctrines, have been codified in the Talmud, and, and Judaism is still following those first century rabbis that Yahshua spoke so highly against when he was on the earth. And so the Jews won't come to the Messiah because of the teachings of the rabbis, and Christians won't come to the commandments of Yahweh because of the teachings of the church fathers. And so man has become a major stumbling block in preventing people from truly being the saints of Revelation 14.12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of Elohim and the faith of the Messiah Yahshua. So, do we see, my brothers, how man becomes his own worst enemy? Man's, man's dung, man's words, man this, man that, becomes the problem. And there's this, there's this tendency to gravitate toward the things that we can see with our eyes, to worship the creature rather than the creator. To look at the the, um, the the pleasing of men, because it's instantly gratifying when you please men, rather than walking by faith, not by sight, and knowing that if we heed the words of the scriptures, we will be pleasing to Yahweh, and that's all that really matters. Now, Yahshua specifically warned us about false prophets who would teach against the Torah, and he prophesied about them. Now, before I go any further, I do want to say one thing, okay? I'm speaking very strongly today against, I should say, I'm speaking strongly today against what is basically churchianity and where it stands right now. Um, and Judaism also. But I want to say this, that when it comes to actual application, and a personal application. I don't condemn my fellow Christians, and I don't condemn the, my fellow Jews. 
I don't condemn them. And I don't know for a fact that they will be condemned on that final day of judgment. And I'll tell you why. Because there are people who are in Christianity who truly love the Messiah and truly want to do what pleases our Father in heaven. But they have not yet been revealed the blessing of the Sabbath and the other things that we have hold we consider to be a blessing to us. And so they don't understand yet the law has not been abolished. They haven't grasped a hold of that. And so I'm not here to condemn them. And in fact, I don't condemn those Jewish people who don't believe in the Messiah. And I'll tell you why I don't condemn them. Because a lot of the Jewish people who don't believe in the Messiah have never even been told about him. And the reason why they haven't been really told about him because the Messiah that's been presented to them is not the Messiah that's in the Bible. The, the, the Torah-breaking, long-haired, toga-wearing, blonde-haired, blue-eyed uh, Messiah with a sun disc uh, halo behind his head uh, that abolished the Torah, that was born December 25th and uh, died on Good Friday, or was raised Easter Sunday, and um, encouraged people to break Torah and change the Sabbath day, that's not the Messiah presented in the Bible. And so when Judaism, the Jewish people, they're presented this kind of Messiah, they're actually required in the Torah to reject him. If that's the Messiah that they're told about, the Torah itself requires that they reject a Messiah who, do, who does these things. Now, that's not the true Messiah. That's not the Messiah of the New Testament. And so, in my mind, the Jewish people, many of them, they don't know anything more about the Messiah, the true Messiah, Yahshua, than a man uh, living in the, in the jungles of South America. And have never heard about a Bible or heard about anything. And so, what will happen to those who have never been really shown who the Messiah is? Uh, I certainly expect that Yahweh does not, um, this is what we see in Scripture, He does not condemn the people who don't know any better. And so, I'm expecting His mercy. And, uh, and so, I don't judge even the Jewish people. When I went to Israel a few years ago, and I was walking around as a believer in the Messiah Yahshua with tassels on. Everywhere I went, people wanted to know what I believed. And most of them had never heard of the possibility of Yahshua being a Torah observant man and teaching his followers to do it. In fact, I was in Miami, Florida, in the Jewish section, uh, actually Miami Beach, Florida, in the Jewish area, and uh, went into one of the Jewish reading rooms where they have all these rabbis, re their writings and everything. And uh, the main head guy of the synagogue there, the, the rabbi, we talked to him about the Messiah, Yahshua, and he had never heard of the possibility that Yahshua actually kept the Torah and taught his followers to do that. He'd never heard of anybody who'd ever done that before. And so... What I'm saying is, as strongly as I'm speaking here, this is a warning for all of us, okay? A warning for all of us, as strongly as I'm speaking here about how much churchianity I see scripturally is in error and Judaism is scripturally in error. When it comes to individual people, individuals, I don't judge. The, the religion itself, both religions are way off. But as far as individuals, um, I want to let Yahweh be the judge, not me. Because that, uh, that's, <laughs> that's the reality in the end anyway. I won't be judging anyone. It'll be Yahweh who is a judge. Now, Yahshua specifically warned about false prophets who teach against the Torah. And uh, what's interesting is, just before he warned us about the false prophets... He warned us about this very thing that we kind of see today where when you try to communicate the blessing of the Torah, the blessing of Yahweh's Sabbath and so on to people, they look and they say, how can all these people be wrong? 
and they just can't fathom how all those people could be wrong and they go about their business ignoring what you say well Yahshua said just prior to warning us about false prophets he said this Matthew 7 13 he said enter by the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and there are many who go in by it because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life and there are few who find it few who find it now there's few who find it even fewer are gonna walk it and so relatively speaking very few people are even on that narrow road and um, so expect huge crowds who walk in the way that's not right and only a few who are on the narrow path and so when I look down through history I don't look at the church fathers and say how can all those people be wrong I look at the large crowds of Christians over, over history and say how could all these people actually be right and Yahshua's words be right at the same time because he said few find it and right after warning us about the few he says this he says beware of false prophets verse 15 who come to you in sheep's clothing they look like a sheep they look like a lamb but inwardly they are ravenous wolves how can you tell a difference you will know them by their fruits do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles even so every tree bears good fruit every good tree bears good fruit but a bad tree bears bad fruit a good tree cannot bear bad fruit nor can a bad tree bear good fruit every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire therefore by their fruits you shall know them see every tree has a root system every tree has a root system from which it is getting its nutrients a root system that is not feeding on the nutrition of Yahweh's Word and I would include the Torah in that is going to be a bad tree and for this reason its fruit will not be good fruit and so we all need to look at the root system and that's why I share with you today about the roots of Christianity and the roots of Judaism both of them are feeding on the words of men not the words of Yahweh they're rooted in what man is doing not what Yahweh is doing as a whole as a as a complete picture I'm not judging individuals once again so is our root system churchianity is our root system the persona of a denomination you know even we can get caught up in that too is our root system being a messianic or being a sacred namer is our root system a grandfather a father a mother a, a grandmother is our root system a friend that we're impressed with what is our root system Western Gentile Christianity or is it the Hebraic roots that are based off the true and living Word of Yahweh well our root system is going to be revealed in that final day Matthew 7 21 continuing here he says not everyone who says to me master master shall enter the kingdom of heaven but he who does the will of my father in heaven many will say to me in that day there's the broad path many will say to me in that day master master have we not prophesied in your name cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name and then I will declare to them I never knew you depart from me you who practice lawlessness Torahlessness I like to say and um, 
The one not doing the will of their Father in heaven is those who are practicing Torahlessness. Now, practicing, very important. We all fail from time to time. We all make, we all sin from time to time. But is it our practice? Is this something we're trying to practice? That's the important question. And what is this lawlessness? What is that word in the Greek? Anomia, which is the condition of without law because of ignorant or because of violation of that law. A contempt or violation of the law. And in the Strong's lexicon is illegality, violation of the law. Or in genitive case, wickedness. And so we have a very clear, very clear warning about our root system. Is it in the will of our Father in heaven? Is it in the Torah? Or is it in violation of that Torah? Have we tapped into a root system that is contrary to the Torah and in violation of the law? If we've tapped into that kind of a root system, heed the warnings. Because many will say to me in that day, haven't we done all these things? You'll say, I never knew you. You're not doing the will of my Father in heaven. You are in violation of the law of Yahweh. It is your practice to violate Yahweh's word. Now when the truth, like these things I just shared with you, when these kinds of truths are revealed to some pastors and some shepherds, there will be many of them who are sincere and will repent. I shouldn't say there's many, there'll be a few. <laughs> but others though, for various reasons that only Yahweh knows a lot of times, will not repent. And this is where we find either a Saul or a David, a Pharisee or a humble disciple. A shepherd intent on feeding himself, fearing the loss of his pension, or a true shepherd who is desirous of the truth. The, pro the false prophets, the false shepherds who lead Yahweh's people astray, Yahweh says, he will judge. Ezekiel 34 verse 2. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Master Yahweh to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? Fox, you eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost, but with force and cruelty you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. And so there were false shepherds, and there are false shepherds. Men who were far more interested in feeding themselves, the hirelings. The hirelings who do not care for the sheep, they care about themselves and feeding themselves. The hireling shepherds, they want to make sure that they, are, they retire at ease. And so when they're presented the truth, and even if their heart convicts them, they can't fathom losing their job. They have so much invested in their denomination and so much respect of men and so much um, so much caught up in their church and the things going on in their church that they won't teach the people the truth even if they know it because same thing as the Pharisees the respect and praise of men is more important to them than the praise of Elohim and so we're, we've come full circle. You know, Christianity, as they condemn the Pharisees, become guilty of the same things. Yahshua warned the, te the teachers in first century Judaism how they caused others to stumble. 
In Luke chapter 11, verse 49, he says, Therefore the wisdom of Elohim also said, I'll send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the temple, yes, I say to you, it shall be required of this generation. Woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter in yourselves, and those who were, who were entering in you hindered. The key of knowledge is the word of Yahweh. That's where we get our wisdom. And they decide to put their own commandments and doctrines of men in its place. And so, that's the danger. That's the danger. Now, lest you think you're safe. Oh, I'm not a shepherd. I'm okay. I'm, not, I'm okay. Let's continue reading Ezekiel here. I'd like to read the whole chapter, but it's not enough time. It says, But as for you, O my flock, Ezekiel 34, 17, Thus says the Master Yahweh, Behold, I shall judge between sheep and sheep, between rams and goats. Remember when Yahshua said the there will be the, the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And he will judge between the two. And the sheep were the ones who cared for one another. They visited the, those who were in prison. They, they ministered to the sick. They cared for one another. And the goats didn't, didn't care about anything. And so he says, Is it too little for you to have eaten up the good pasture that you must tread down with your feet the residue of your pasture? And to have drunk of the clear waters, that you must foul the residue with your feet. And as for my flock, they eat which you have trampled with your feet, and they drink which you have fouled with your feet. Therefore, thus says the Master Yahweh to them, Behold, I myself will judge between the fat and the lean sheep. He said to the disciples, It is impossible. I'm sorry. I guess I missed the latter part. But it says, Um, I will judge between the, the fat and the lean sheep, verse 21, because you have pushed with side and shoulder, butted all the weak ones with your horns, and scattered them abroad. Therefore I will save my flock, and they will no longer be a prey. I will judge between sheep and sheep. And so, um, Yahweh, I think the Messiah actually, will judge even between those in the body of Messiah. There were some who really truly loved and cared about the body of Messiah, and there were those who just didn't really care. And uh, they just kind of knocked their way around and, um, and not have any concern about others. And so all these men, both who leaders and those within the body of Messiah, becoming stumbling blocks to one another. And so man is a very major stumbling block. And in fact, Yahshua says, as you probably saw earlier, he said, Luke 17, verse 1, he said to the disciples, It is impossible that no offenses should come, no stumbling blocks should come. But woe to him through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. And it's the little ones. It's the young believers and the little children who become offended by the actions of the ones who claim to be the more mature ones and yet are self-centered and are not walking as Messiah told them to walk. You know, I think that happens a lot sometimes, brothers, in our own faith that there will be people who will come into our faith who are brand new, who are young, and all these people put their finger out, you know, pointing the finger, condemning, 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 tearing down, tearing down, do this, do this, do this, do this, and then we'll accept you. Come on, do this, do this, this. And, um, and they see how people treat one another. And some people over time through the body of Messiah become bitter at the way some people treat each other. And they begin treating others the same way because they've judged. With what judgment you judge, you become judged, you become tested by. And so, that's what happens. Yahweh will judge between sheep and sheep. 
We, brothers, we have to be gentle with the young ones. And the young ones include our own children in the faith. Yeah, and I, I can say it my own self. You know, it says in scriptures, Fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath. Don't provoke them to anger. But you know, a harsh word, according to the Proverbs, stirs up anger. And so if I ever have spoken, I know I have, to my children in a harsh tone, then I'm, do, I'm disobeying scripture myself and provoking them. And so we become stumbling blocks to our own children by provoking them to anger with a harsh word or with other things that we do, hypocrisy or whatever. And so as fathers, as mothers, we need to be very careful that we, toward our family members, toward our little ones, that we don't cause them to stumble by our actions. And we also need to be careful about ourselves. Because the company we keep become, a lot of times, who we are. The company we keep. Who are our close friends? Who are the ones that we turn to? Are they righteous men of Yahweh? Are, are they relatives that don't even fear Yahweh? Or are they friends that don't even fear Yahweh? Who are our close friends? Our close friends become stumbling blocks. I don't have it here in front of me, but there's a scripture that says, uh, go from the presence, uh, something about, uh, not to make an angry man your friend, or you will learn his ways and become a snare for your soul. Um, look, I have it in front of me, actually. Proverbs 22, verse 24 and 25. Make no friendship with an angry man. And with a furious man do not go, lest you learn his ways and set a snare for your soul. And so that angry man becomes something you learn from. And you become ensnared by it. Um, and so do we see how we become stumbling blocks to each other, even within the body of Messiah? You know, Scripture says, don't be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. If we're around wickedness all the time, if we're in a workplace where there's nothing but wickedness going on all the time, I know a lot of times the construction industry is full of people that don't fear Elohim. I was in a part of that for a while. And it became very vexing and oppressive to my soul to be around them. What well, says, don't be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. We may have to find another way to do it. Um, start your own company or do something. But you know, the, the spiritual stumbling blocks are very important. You know, we as fathers and husbands, we have a responsibility also. You know, we, we might think of, um, you know, how important it is. You know, if, if some intruder came into our house and... Uh, we be there, you know, to protect our families. Um, but, you know, there's spiritual intruders also. So we have a, a responsibility to protect not only from physical intruders, physical people uh, who may physically harm our family, but also we have to be aware of people who would spiritually harm our families. And because the spiritual realm is far more important and the implications are far more eternal. And the importance of this even expands into the assembly as a whole. Those of you who are elders, according to scripture, you have a responsibility to protect and, and watch over the flock. And when there's an intruder coming in who is not a fear, uh, does not fear Elohim, he's leading people astray and becoming a stumbling block to people, something has to be done about it. Yahshua, when he wrote to the assembly of Pergamos, he said to the angel of the assembly of Pergamos, actually that word angel there is, is uh, probably messenger, and probably you're talking to the elders there of each assembly. Um, these, things, these things says he who has a sharp two-edged sword, I know your works and where you dwell where Satan's throne is. We covered the scripture last week. Where Satan's throne is, and um, you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, 
who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. See, part of our calling is to deliver those who are stumbling. We have a responsibility to our brothers, especially those who are in authority in the body of Messiah. Those of you who are elders, you have a responsibility to deliver people from stumbling blocks. Proverbs 24, verse 11 and 12 says, Deliver those who are drawn toward death and hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, Surely we did not know this. Does not he who weighs the hearts consider it? He who keeps your soul, does he not know it? And will he not render to each man according to his deeds? So we, brothers, we all, we are all our brother's keeper. And we see something causing our brothers and sisters in the faith to stumble. We have to be deliverers. We have to step in by the mercies of Yahweh as Yahweh leads us and deliver them. Now, a very, very important thing to keep in mind. And this is the, the uh, final por portion here. Is that we, as brothers in the faith, that we ourselves do not become stumbling blocks to others. The Torah says in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 14, it says, You shall not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall fear your Elohim. I am Yahweh. See, Yahweh does not want us because maybe we've been enlightened in some area, spiritually. Now, I'm talking about spiritual blindness here. Maybe we've been enlightened in some way spiritually. And if we come down harshly, and we're rude, and we're condemning, and we're bitter toward those who are blinded in these areas, we become a stumbling block to those who are blind. And so spiritual blindness is very common. We all probably have some spiritual blindness in certain areas. And so we come down so harshly, so judgmental toward others in their blindness. With what judgment we judge, we will be judged. And so we have to be careful that when we become enlightened that we don't become arrogant and puffed up, knowledge puffs up, but that instead we become not a stumbling block, but a stepping stone. So we need to be very careful that we are not a source of stumbling for those who are outside the body of Messiah even. As Yahshua's body, we're called to be representatives of Yahshua himself. It's a high calling that we take seriously. You know, Yahshua himself was careful to the best of his, the what he could do within being obedient to Yahweh, not to be a stumbling block to others. In Matthew 17, 24, it says, when they had come to Capernaum, those who received the temple tax came to Peter and says, Does your teacher not pay the temple tax? He said, Yes. And when he came into the house, Yahshua anticipated him, saying, What do you think, Simon, from whom do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes, from their sons or from strangers? Peter said to him, From strangers. Yahshua said to him, Then the sons are free. Nevertheless, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook, take the fish that comes up first, and when you've opened his mouth, you'll find a piece of money, take that and give it to them for me and you. He just didn't want to offend them. He was free from the temple tax. But he didn't want them to stumble. He went ahead and paid the tax. You know, actually, historically, the temple tax was not even a requirement in the first century. But it was expected that a devoted person who was truly a, a strong believer would pay it. And, um, and so, lest anyone think that, you know, this, lest anyone stumble over their example, he went ahead and paid the tax. Now, Acts 24, verse 15 
Paul himself followed this principle. I have hope in Elohim that they themselves also accept, talking about the uh, Pharisees. He's being judged here before the, uh, the courts. He says, There will be a resurrection of the dead, both the just and the unjust. This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense toward Elohim and toward men. And that's why he said, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3, We give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed. Now, we don't need to be man-pleasers in the sense that we seek the praise of men more than the praise of Yahweh, but we should seek to be a people who don't unnecessarily cause offense unless somehow our commandment keeping would be an offense to someone. 2 Corinthians 10.32 says, Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the assembly of Elohim, just as I also please all in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they might be saved. So he was careful not to be a source of stumbling for someone else. And it's very important that we as children of Yahweh are working to edify one another and not be a stumbling block to unbelievers as well. Paul wrote in Romans 14, 13, Therefore let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or cause to fall in our brother's way. It speaks of this also in 1 Corinthians 8, verse 8. It says, For food does not commend us to Elohim, for neither if we eat are we the better, not, or if we do not eat, are we the worse? But beware lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. And on verse 13, he says, Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never again eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Now, um, you see the same principle, Romans 14, verse 19, he says, Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace, and things by which one may edify another. Do not destroy the work of Elohim for the sake of food. All things are indeed pure. Speaking of things that are actually food, of course. Not pig. Not pig. pig is not food. <laughs> but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. It is good neither to eat meat or drink wine or do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Our goal is to edify one another, not cause each other to stumble, even in things that we are permitted to do scripturally. Now, you know, some people have perverted all these scriptures and saying, oh, we can go ahead and eat pork if we're afraid someone might stumble over it. But the context of these verses has to do with uh, eating clean meats at a dinner table in someone else's home uh, where a, uh, it may or may not have been offered to an idol. We don't know. Okay, you don't have to ask questions for conscience sake because the actual prohibition in uh, Acts 15 if you study it it was actually about going into the idol of a temple and having a fellowship meal with that idol so now if our decisions to walk in righteousness might cause someone to stumble that's not on us that's not our responsibility. If we walk in truth, we walk in righteousness, we're obeying a commandment of Yahweh, and someone stumbles at that, that's not our responsibility. We're doing, we're walking the Yahshua walk. We're doing the things that Yahshua did. Yahshua never compromised and said, oh, well, if, if I do this, then they might, if I obey Yahweh, then they might, uh, they might stumble at that. He didn't care whether they stumbled or not. In fact, they did stumble at him because he was obedient to the Father. And um, and so um, it's very important that we understand the difference, that we don't be so concerned about stumbling stumbling that we end up disobeying Yahweh ourselves, because then we stumble. That's what a stumbling is, it's causing someone to disobey the Father by what we do. Hosea 14, verse 9 says, Who is wise? Let him understand these things. Who is prudent? Let him know them. For the ways of Yahweh are right. The righteous walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. 
And isn't that the truth? So many times I'm caught between a rock and a hard place. <laughs> and I, uh, I cleave to the rock, at least I try to. But people stumble because I'm trying to do what Yahweh says. But the Messiah's obedience to Yahweh was a stumbling block to the Jews because of their pride. They could not fathom that their Messiah, the Messiah rather, would be hanged on a tree. They couldn't fathom that. And so Yahshua's obedience to the Father became a stumbling block to them. 1 Corinthians 1.22 For the Jews request a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Messiah crucified, to the Jews a stumbling block. To the Greeks foolishness, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Messiah, the power of Elohim, and the wisdom of Elohim. I think Israel was expecting this self-promoting, prideful king. Instead, they got this humble, lowly king entering Jerusalem on a donkey, who relied upon Yahweh for his exalt exaltation and for his glorification. You know, the amazing thing is, King David was the same way. He didn't exalt himself. He didn't force his way in. And neither does Yahshua. But he waited on Yahweh to exalt him at the, in, in the proper time. And so, let's look at uh, Isaiah chapter 8 for a minute. 8 verse 12. It says, Do not say a conspiracy concerning all that this people call a conspiracy, nor be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. Now, I guess they had conspiracy theories causing fear even back then, huh? Uh, Yahweh of hosts, him you shall hallow. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. He will be as a sanctuary, but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both houses of Israel, as a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. What? And many of them shall stumble. They shall fall and be broken, be snared and taken. That's because he did not accept the Messiah. This was all predicted that the Messiah would become the stumbling block. So it says here, bind up the testimony, seal the Torah, the law, among my disciples. That's disciples of Yahshua. And I will wait on Yahweh, who hides his face from the house of, ja of ja Jacob, and I will hope in him. Here I am in the children whom Yahweh has given me. You know, this is actually a scripture quoted in Hebrews. Talking about the Messiah. This is Messiah speaking here. We are for signs and wonders in Israel from Yahweh of hosts who dwells in Mount Sion. And when they say to you, Seek those who are mediums and wizards who whisper and mutter, should not a people seek their Elohim? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? Talking about necromancy and mediums and uh, seeking the words that are not from Yahweh but are from the enemy of Yahweh, Satan the devil. And it goes on to say, To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So that's confirmation, brothers, from the, the writings of Isaiah, that if we are walking according to the law and the testimony, we are walking in the light, and we will not be caused to stumble. You know, even those who followed Messiah Yahshua, who were his disciples, for a time were caused to stumble by his obedience to Yahweh. In Matthew twenty six thirty one says, Yahshua said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. Before it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered and said to him, Even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Now, we know Kepha learned the hard lesson of not boasting. Not boasting. But to let a man take heed lest he fall, right? And the same is true for us. We should never be so prideful as to assume, Oh, I'll be all right. I won't stumble. I can get caught up in this thing and not stumble. 
We've got to be careful. If something is causing us to stumble, then maybe we need not to go there again. So we've got to be careful. Now, Yahshua even became a stumbling block to his disciples for a time, for the three-day period. But then he was raised again. And then they knew the power of Elohim was upon him. And then, then they realized all these scriptures, the law and testimony, had predicted accurately what the Messiah would do. Now to this day there are some who stumble over his example. How could the mighty king, the, the uh, mighty king of Israel, become hanged on a tree, become accursed? They can't fathom that. Jewish people a lot of times can't fathom that. But it's all predicted in the prophets as we even saw here. Now, the dangers of us becoming a stumbling block to others. I want to expand on that just a little bit more and we're going to close out today. Yahshua said in Matthew 13 verse 40, it says, Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend. And that word, if you look it up, has to do with people who are causing others to stumble. And those who practice lawlessness. And will cast them into the fire, furnace of fire. There should be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Wow. Of course, that word lawlessness is indeed um, Torahlessness, the violation of the law we spoke of earlier. So, we have to be careful, brothers, because Yahshua, when he comes, he's not only going to destroy those who cause others to, who actually disobey and practice lawlessness, he's also going to destroy those who are a stumbling block to others from being able to walk in righteousness. Now, there are many ways in which we may fall into this trap and becoming a stumbling block to others. It can be in our conduct, the way we carry ourselves, the way we speak, the tone of voice by which we speak can be a stumbling block to others. Arrogancy and pride toward others can be a stumbling block to them. The way we dress can be a stumbling block to others, specifically those of you who are women and girls. If you're dressing in a way that causes someone else to lust and look after your look at your body parts, you are not without guilt because you are causing others to stumble into into disobedience into adultery of the heart by the way you dress and uh, I've got a study actually on modesty and it's for this reason I do have a dress code at the feast I don't want brothers to come to the feast and have the whole feast ruined because all the ladies are waltzing around dressed immodestly I would like that my I like my brothers in, in Yahweh um, to be able to come to a feast and not have to have this constant barrage, you know, uh, neon lights flashing everywhere saying "Go lust at this," okay. And uh, and so that's why I have a dress code. And some people think I'm Pharisaical because of that, but. Um, but the purpose of the feast is to edify the body of Messiah. And if everybody's dressed like they shouldn't be dressed, then no one's going to get edified the way they should. And so that's one important way that uh, we have to avoid stumbling is in the way we dress. Another important way is how a husband treats his wife. If he's not loving his wife, and I fail at this, if, if I'm not loving my wife the way I should, then I become a stumbling block to her. From her being able to respect me the way that Yahweh tells her to reverence and respect me. The same is true of a wife and how she treats her husband. If she's not being respectful to him and reverencing him as the scripture says and submitting to him, 
that makes it very difficult for him to love her the way he should. Same, th same thing as how we as parents can provoke our children to wrath. We can become a stumbling block for our own children. Or how believers treat unbelievers can be a stumbling block. Or how believers treat one another can be a stumbling block. And so we have to be very careful about how we do not become an agent of the devil by causing others to trip, causing others to stumble. They're responsible when they stumble. They're responsible for their own sin. When they, make, when they do their sin, they're responsible for it. But you know what? We're responsible for causing them to stumble. We did our part, even as they did their part. Because we're basically imitating what Satan does. Satan's always trying to get us to stumble. Always trying to get others to trip up. And so both the way we dress, the way we talk, the way we act, the way we love, or not love, the things that we do, we have to be cautious that we're not a stumbling block to one another. Especially to little ones. Yahshua said it's better for a man to have a millstone tied around his neck and be thrown into the sea than he should cause one of the little ones to stumble. And so it's a very serious thing that we need to take seriously. That we don't become a stumbling block. You know, we can't... We, you know, we know Satan wants to cause people to stumble. And he's always looking for a way to trip us up. And if we're following his example, then we cannot expect to be held blameless for it. And if we're walking in the ways of Balaam, whom Yahushua condemned that assembly in, in Pergamos for, for tolerating those people who walked in the way of Balaam and causing a stumbling block so that the, the, uh, the people would be committing sexual immorality. And if there are assemblies who are allowing women to come into the assembly who are dressing like harlots and dressing like the world, you, I believe, according to Scripture, if you're an elder and you're doing this, I believe according to Scripture, I have to be frank, you're allowing the stumbling block of Balaam to come in because that's exactly what Balaam did. He sent in these harlot women to go and, and commit fornication with Israel and cause them to stumble. We can't have that. And so while Balaam would not curse Israel directly, he was able to cause Israel to fall into disobedience through causing them to stumble. Now we live in a land of, of fornicators. We need to have no part of what they are, how they dress, or what they do. So we need to take the stumbling blocks out of our own lives, and we have to set up safeguards to protect us from stumbling blocks. May Yahweh give us ears to hear and discerning hearts to understand how important it is. Fear of men can cause us to stumble, but the fear of Yahweh will lead us to wisdom. Because in the end, my brothers, it will not be church fathers, it will not be rabbis, it will not be our spouses, it will not be our children, it will not be our brethren, it will not be anyone else standing next to us to judge us on the day of judgment, declaring us guilty or not guilty. We will all stand before the judgment seat of the Messiah and we will give account. Not for whether our lives were pleasing to men or in accordance with any man's teachings, but we will give an account for whether or not we lived our lives in obedience to the word of Yahweh. And that's all that's going to matter. And so let's walk in the way of peace. Trusting in the grace of Yahweh, to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from our sins and yet cleaving to the Torah, the law of Yahweh, for direction, for guidance, and for light in our lives. And if we do that, brothers, we will never stumble and nothing will cause us to stumble. Psalm 119, verse 165, Great peace have those who love your law and nothing causes them to stumble. And if we cleave to the Messiah and the Torah, we are in double protection, my brothers. Because he is able to keep you from stumbling, Jude 1.24, and to present you faultless 
before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To Elohim our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. May Yahweh indeed keep our feet from stumbling, and may Yahweh bless you and have mercy on us all.